Um, I'm very happy to be pre presenting this paper on how much we can generalize from impact evaluations. One kind of entertaining thing that I think Rachel pointed out, or maybe it was Mike, is that all three of us are presenting our far more job market papers. So um, I'll try to remember what I did here. <laughs> I haven't presented it in a while, but I um, you know, obviously have worked on the paper. Um, so, oh dear, there's this thing to trip over. So basically, the question I'm trying to ask here is how much can we generalize? And um, if there's um, some heterogeneity in treatment effects, why is that the case? So is it that there are implementation differences or context differences? Is it just sampling error? Um, and also to what extent specification searching or publication bias matters, although that I sort of siphoned off into its own paper. Um, and it's an important question because impact evaluations are um, used to inform policy decisions, at least hopefully that is what they do. Um, and yet, if we see that different um, studies have got different results, then we don't really know um, what the next study or what will be the true effect in some other program that we're anticipating. Um, so we need to understand a little bit about how much variance we can expect here and if results vary, why? Now, there's a big literature now on heterogeneity and treatment effects. Um, Bold et al. had this early example of um, looking at a study in the same place um, that found different effects. Um, there's um, this paper by Alcott that you just heard about this morning on site selection bias. And people have certainly examined heterogeneity and treatment effects in uh, particular situations as well. So um, conditional cash transfers. Um, I should also have Rachel's uh, microfinance here. Um, there's been you know, some general critiques of impact evaluations um, from uh, Deaton, Sandifer, and Pritchett um, that a little bit relate to this issue of um, external validity. And um, there's uh, a lot of knowledge of heterogeneity and treatment effects from this really old literature um, in other disciplines, so Campbell and Stanley in 1963, for example. So um, here's the growth of impact evaluations. I should really update this figure to have another uh, 10 years here now almost. Um, and essentially, you know, these are all different kinds of impact evaluations. So you've got some RCTs. Um, you've got impact evaluations very broadly that 3IE is compiling. These are just, you can think of like, they're compiling a bunch of abstracts. But you can just see that the, the growth of impact evaluations is astonishing. Um, and back in 2012, I started an organization that collected all this data. So um, you can think of this as essentially a database of 635 impact evaluations, uh, most of which are RCTs, across 20 particular areas. And these were collected in the context of meta-analysis, uh, sometimes turned into systematic review because there just weren't that many. Um, but um, the goal was for meta-analysis, so these data are um, quite nice to be able to speak to this question a little bit more broadly because everything's gathered in the same way. And um, so I can try to speak to this a bit. So where I'm going with this, um, I'll walk you some, through some theory, um, talk to you a little bit about the method and the heterogeneity measures that I'll be using, um, talk to you through the data and um, some results here. So um, um, basically, I'll be looking at the um, probability of being able to infer the correct sign and how um, great in magnitude you could expect a prediction error to be, essentially, um, uh, if you are um, extrapolating to another study that is roughly from the same distribution as the ones that you've already got. So to make a quick contrast to um, the external validity definition that Mike was talking about earlier uh, about extrapolating from a set um, uh, to a different target group. Um, my underlying assumption is that even if the studies in this group are selected in some way, I'm thinking of extrapolating to um, a study that could have been from that group, essentially. Um, it's drawn from the same data generating process, as it were. So it's also biased. Um, so there are certainly other biases that may exist, like site selection bias, surely. Um, nonetheless, I think that this piece of it can uh, still speak to an interesting part of it. Okay, so 
I don't think I need to go over uh, fixed effects and random effects models anymore after this groundwork, but just to remind you of the notation that I use again, here's the notation again, where I've got your point estimates, your true um, um, effects in any different, given study, um, and I'm going to assume um, that things are normally distributed. I've got some prior um, um, that these different um, study effects are distributed normally around some mean and with some tau. Um, and I can write down a likelihood. I can also write down the posterior. Um, so these look like those kinds of uh, um, estimates that you were seeing earlier. Um, nothing fancy here. So I'm going to be like blazing through this because you've seen a lot of this material before. Um, but yes, you can make a Bayesian hierarchical model. Um, you can, um, what I'm going to say for my priors is that uh, my priors are going to be uniformly distributed, um, both for uh, um, me and Tau there, and then I'll update those based on the data. So great. Um, you also know about mixed models. This is fantastic. I've never had such a <laughs> well uh, on the ball audience here. Um, so I'm also going to sometimes include an explanatory variable. Um, and so you can think of that as a, a mixed model. Um, and the methods are going to be broadly speaking the same, um, except we're going to be estimating um, some very optimistically termed a vector of beta is actually just going to be probably one, right? <laughs> because of this uh, restriction we've been talking about where you don't have that many studies. You just can't estimate all of the nice things that you would want to estimate. Okay. So in terms of measuring generalizability, um, there's this big problem that nobody really agrees on how this should be estimated. Um, and this is a huge problem. <laughs> Um, so let me try to talk through this. I'll give you some examples of what I think is are reasonable measures and how they relate to heterogeneity measures. Um, <clears throat> so actually, I'm going to start with the heterogeneity measures here. And if I just ask you, you know, what's a good measure of heterogeneity, you might come up with two general kinds of measures that you would have in mind. So one kind of measure, broadly speaking, would be these measures that just capture the variation overall. So think of like the variance of the point estimates. Well, that would be a thing. Or, you know, the true intrastudy variance. So, right? So that's just one natural kind of measure you would have in mind. You might also think, though, about the proportion of the variance that you can systematically explain. Um, so um, you'll see some examples of that. But essentially, um, I'm just saying that you know, if you could um, explain some of the variance, um, so say I can take away sampling variance, for example, um, that tells me something about um, how much variance remains. Um, if I could explain all of the variance, well, then I wouldn't even care that there's a lot of variance. I would just explain things and be done with it. Um, so both of these things can be important. <clears throat> so, okay, some of these are things I talked about. You could just have your variance in effects, um, your true interstudy variance, tau squared. Um, and I mentioned earlier this coefficient of variation, um, which you can think of as tau over mu in my model. Okay? And I mentioned we want some proportions of variation. Here's the proportion of variance that's not sampling error. It's this term called I squared. Um, and so um, you can think of this as essentially capturing the proportion um, of total variance. Remember, total variance will be your sigma squared plus your tau squared here, your, um, both your sampling error and your um, true interstudy variance. Um, so put you know, the true variance of effect sizes on top of that, and you've got your proportion. And what you can do is, if you've got some nice mixed model, um, then you can essentially um, calculate some residual tau squared, as it were, your tau squared um, that remains, the, the interstudy variation that remains after you've taken these explanatory variables into consideration. So you can shrink tau squared a little bit by doing this. Um, so great. Again, that's important just for, um, you know, if you're trying to think of um, what's the importance and implications of this, and you think of the situation in which you're making some kind of policy decision, 
um, you know, you, to a certain extent, don't care if there's a, a variance if you can explain it, right? Um, the issue is what do you do in situations where you can't explain it? And as we heard earlier, that will be a lot of the time, actually. Yes, question. For idiots, guys, so that that's a standard frequentist thing to do as well, like that comes out of our forest plots. We would see that statistic. So, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, a lot of things, um, so you will see people talking about tau squared, you will hear people talking about the coefficient of variation, you will hear people talking about I squared. What I wish there was more agreement on in the literature is which of these is really important. Um, in the sense that, you know, you'll hear these things referenced, but, um, uh, I mean, I could tell stories of uh, how much difference there would be in, you know, referees' opinions of which ones of these are important. So, I can clearly say there's not a consensus. <laughs> um, yeah. But you will get, I mean, some of these things will, you know, uh, pop out at you from what you're doing. Okay. And... Part of the underlying difficulty here is that no one measure is actually really perfect. Like, even though I myself am partial, say, to tau squared, it's still got one particular issue. So, in particular, you might think, well, if I'm wanting to have a good measure of heterogeneity here, well, first, I probably want a measure um, that ideally doesn't depend on the precision of the individual estimates, because that's getting at, well, the precision of the estimates, not you know, this true underlying heterogeneity in some way. So, okay, well, that knocks out the I squared. Um, then you say, well, yes, but I want something that will also not depend on the units of um, that particular outcome. So, you know, you've got some outcomes like cash transfers um, on enrollment rates and percentage points. Okay, that's percentage points. And then you've got something else that's like, um, I don't know, impact of deworming on height, and that's in centimeters, or um, microfinance on profits. Like, these are wildly different scales, potentially. Um, and some of these things, like just the variance of the point estimates or this true um, interstudy variance measure, are going to depend on the units, which is really unfortunate. Like, I would like to be able to say something like, oh, yeah, you know, if you've got a tau squared greater than two or whatever, then you've got a problem. But I can't say that because it would be meaningless because everything's got different units. Um, and what you could also do is to look at the coefficient of variation, but, you know, that's going to depend on the mean result of the cell because you've got your mean there in your denominator. And unfortunately, if you've got a small mean, the thing will blow up. And that's maybe not a desirable property. Um, so, I mean, and it's unfortunate because the coefficient of variation along with the I squared is unitless. At least it does fill in this, but no, still, there's no measure that gets all these things. Um, so, problem. Now, an insight that one could have is, well, look, these measures are meaningful within the context of the model. So um, if you actually believe that you've got a good model, um, then they will tell you about how likely a result is to replicate. Um, and you can uh, slightly um, extend this earlier work. So Gelman and Carlin and Gelman and Twerlings uh, look at these type S um, errors for sign or type M errors for magnitude, where essentially they're saying, what's the um, likelihood that, given all that I know about a certain setting, including, you know, estimates of um, tau and mu, um, how likely is it that um, if I were to rerun the exact same study, I would get um, a different sign? If I originally, say, had something that was um, significant or whatever. I had originally some kind of estimate. Um, now I want to rerun it. How likely is it that the replication will have the same sign? And how likely is it that the replication will um, be of a, you know, what will, by what extent will the replication be a different magnitude? Okay. So this is in the context of replications, but you can use the same kind of idea to look at how um, um, likely you are to get a different sign um, if you're doing another study that's maybe in a different context. It's the exact same idea, really. Um, and I would like to point out that, you know, these are obviously just two types of questions that one can ask. I think that they're particularly relevant for policy because you may think, well, look, I do want to know what the sign of uh, something is for policy, or I do want to know what the magnitude of something is to make a policy decision. Um, 
but there's certainly other types of questions that you could also ask. So this is not an exhaustive list. Um, this is just kind of illustrating that um, I'll be using this to illustrate that tau squared in particular, and also to a certain extent I squared, can be informative um, and useful measures uh, to focus on. Okay, um, so in particular, if you um, actually are fully on board with, you know, your particular model that you've got here, well, um, you can, in fact, uh, figure out what that probability is that um, an inference about an impact um, in another setting um, will have the right sign or be a certain magnitude bigger or smaller, um, depending on what variables that you estimate here. Um, so, um, great, we can estimate some variables and try to sort this out for um, the data that I've got. Um, okay, so what is the data that I've got? Um, so these are data from 8th grade, which um, still exists. It's a, a very small uh, nonprofit based in the U.S., um, which essentially does meta-analyses in uh, development economics. Um, and there were these 20 different types of interventions uh, covered in 2012 and 2013. Um, um, some of them are a little bit uh, vague here, so they fit in the slides. Um, so, uh, for example, um, mobile phone-based reminders was SMS reminders of appointments. Um, and um, we've got, like for health, um, and we've got um, uh, micronutrients really actually being about zinc. Um, so, you know, some of these are a little bit more narrowly defined than they are here, but broadly speaking, you've got a range of different things that should look familiar if you're in development, like cash transfers, deworming, uh, bed nets, you know, we've got a whole bunch of them. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how these are selected. Um, but basically, any impact evaluation that was on one of these topics that tried to have some kind of counterfactual was included. Um, we were including both published papers and um, unpublished unpub papers as best we could find them. Um, we had various fields that were coded up for those papers. Um, so most of these were to try to actually just extract the data in the paper. As I was saying earlier, papers report results in all sorts of different kinds of ways. So, you know, you need a different field for what if they report, um, you know, your coefficient and your standard error. And so those are two columns, right? And then you've got some other columns. You've got six columns if you want to do, you know, what if they report the treatment group mean, the treatment group standard error, the treatment group number of observations, the control group mean, the control group standard error, the control group number of observations, and so on. So you've got all these different things um, and a limited amount of other descriptive variables uh, that you might think useful. So um, things like um, who implemented the program? Um, what methods did they use? Um, where was it done? Things like that. Um, for some of the topics, we got a lot of um, topic-specific fields. So um, the best example there is conditional cash transfers. There's a lot of conditional cash transfers, and it's fairly easy to code a lot of very relevant things, or seemingly relevant things at least. Um, it's like um, what exactly was the condition? Um, you know, was it a condition on enrollment in school? Was it conditioned on attendance in school? Was it conditioned on um, health um, clinic checkups or whatnot? Um, what was the threshold uh, for each of those things? Like you have to go to school 85% of the time, say. Um, who is in the sample? Like um, girls or boys, rural, urban, um, different age ranges and so on. So for some of these, we got to go in quite a lot more detail. Um, but it depends on the topic. Um, some of them didn't um, have, but, I mean, there would not be, you know, if you've got an intervention here that's, you've got like two papers on a common outcome, there's just no point. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, and oftentimes, papers would not even be clear about a lot of the things you would think they would be clear about. Okay, so everything had double entry coding. Um, so let me talk through the process a little bit for the selection of intervention, search screening, and data extraction. So topic selection. Um, basically, so we have followed a slightly different process for the meta-analyses begun in 2012 and 2013, um, largely because at 2012 there was just sort of me trying to drive this process forward. In 2013 there was some staff and it was amazing. Um, but uh, I'll describe the process for 2013 and then say where it's different for 2012. 
So 2013, we had multiple people, so we could do this independent topic list uh, thing. So we, basically, you know, each of us sitting down and being like, well, what are the topics that I think are sort of big in development economics um, in some sense, or might have some literature on them. Um, and um, then we try to consolidate those lists. 2012, it was just me sort of writing down a list of things. <laughs> um, then we would try to refine the topics. So by that I mean trying to get them to the same level of specificity. So some of these, you know, broad ideas were pretty broad, and some of them were very, very narrow. Um, and so we tried to get those roughly comparable and do some pilot searches to see how many papers were seeming to come up. The main thing we were concerned about here is that there aren't that many papers that um, are on comparable intervention outcome combinations. Like it's not just enough to say, well, yeah, but I've got these, um, you know, if you're lucky to have a particular intervention, you've got five papers on that intervention, well, that's great, but do they cover the same outcome variables? Because we're going to need to do all of our analyses within intervention outcome groups, right? Um, because, yeah, uh, we're trying to specifically here look at um, the, um, heterogeneity. Actually, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't originally have this particular project in mind while setting this up, so I'm kind of lucky that we were looking at this level. Um, because you can imagine, as uh, I, was, I was alerting to in the earlier presentation this morning, if, you know, um, in the education literature, say, um, you um, want to maybe have more aggregate um, uh, measures um, and just say, you know, it had an effect on education rather than it had an effect on enrollment rates and then, you know, separately it had an, an effect on test scores or whatever else. Um, but, you know, here um, we were looking for, but here's just like number of papers. So there may be some selection on number of papers. Um, although at this point um, it was very, very low. I think it was two <laughs> at this point. We had to see at least two papers in your, the pilot searches to continue on. Um, nonetheless, we shortlisted based on that and had a public vote, um, actually. Now, the public vote didn't end up binding in the first year because, and this is my bad, mea culpa, <laughs> um, because um, I had listed out there 12 interventions and two of them, there just weren't actually enough papers when you actually really dug into it. They're, they're there, the outcomes did not overlap, so I was like, well, what can we do with this? Um, so, just had to go with the 10 where there were, was some overlap in the outcomes. Um, the second year, it did matter and uh, went with women's empowerment programs as a result of that public vote. Apart from that one, the rest were actually randomized into um, which ones were going to be studied or not. Um, and then from there came up with this final list of topics. So it's um, certainly a, a process where you could argue that at some stages there's some selection going on. Um, it's not uh, fully, um, you know, there's also like some amount that is at least, you know, out of my control and I can certainly say I didn't have this particular paper in mind, but you still want to understand the selection here. Okay, so you've already seen these uh, search and screenings this morning, so I get to jump through it. Um, but essentially, um, if anybody wasn't here this morning, we had a lot of <laughs> intensive search and screening criteria to put in here, but we had very broad search and screening criteria. It's more that this process was just a pain. <laughs> um, and data extraction. Um, now, I mentioned this thing earlier that um, for some analyses, um, you may want to do, you know, some kind of standardization. And what does that mean? So, mostly I'm going to be trying to avoid cases where I need to use um, standardized uh, variables because one can argue with the standardization process itself in a sense. Um, it, so, but in the meta-analysis literature, it's very, very common to try to standardize things. So you've got the standardized mean difference. Um, you can think of this as essentially standardizing various treatment effects by the standard deviation of that outcome variable. Um, now, um, you know, you can say, well, hang on, why are you making this conversion? Isn't, wouldn't you worry that maybe, um, you know, the standard deviation of the outcome variable is going to be different in some papers than in other papers? And so maybe you're somehow, you know, when you say that you're going to be later on looking at um, heterogeneity, um, aren't you worried about this particular source of, um, you know, are, are your results going to be skewed in any way by standard deviations here? Um, so, by and large, I'm staying away from the standardized um, results. Um, I do have to use them when I want to 
look across intervention outcome combinations. Um, so, you know, I'll do a lot of things within intervention outcome, but when I look across, I will use standardized values. Um, the other thing is um, just, you know, as a first pass, you want to make sure that the outcomes representing improvements all, in fact, have the same sign and, you know, so that if you've got a decrease in disease incidence, well, you should regard that as a good thing. Um, that will occasionally be relevant. Um, and as I say, overall, I'll try to represent results in raw units so that they're interpretable um, and um, report disaggregated results. That won't always be the case, but I try to do what I can. So here's just an example to help get minds around it. Um, so, you know, suppose we're looking at some outcomes for conditional cash transfers. You've got test scores. Um, they come in terms of standard deviations, which is great. So I don't have to do anything with them. And I think, you know, positive test scores are a good thing. So you can see here, these are the original units. And these are in terms of standard deviation. So this is roughly, you know, if you take this down to the x-axis here, roughly from minus 0 0.06 to uh, 0 0.21 is where that is. Um, and then attendance rates and percentage points, well, in raw units, those range from 0.03 to uh, 0 0.13, so that, you know, 13 percent, uh, three percentage points to 13 percentage points. If you try to standardize them, they'll fall somewhere over here. Um, <coughs> labor force participation, um, here they ranged from uh, decreasing labor force participation by 11 percentage points um, or increasing it by 2 percentage points. Um, here I flip the sign, you say, well, why did you flip the sign? Uh, generally we think of a labor force participation as a good thing. I would say, yes, but here we're talking about conditional cash transfers. You can think of this as like child labor force participation. Generally we want kids going to school and not working if we're doing a conditional cash transfer program. So that's why the sign there is flipped. Um, <clears throat> but just to give you some example of the manipulation that had been done on the data to try to get it to the point where we can actually analyze it, right? Okay. So, um, and I'm surprised I haven't gotten this question yet, when you're looking at the ability to generalize within a set, how you define that set is going to be critical. Um, so, here, remember, I'm going to be looking at everything within intervention outcome combinations. Um, so, the effect of conditional cash transfers, say, on enrollment rates, right? Um, and you can think, well, look, there's various ways that um, one can take issue with um, how, you know, one's defining these uh, treatment, uh, these interventions and these outcomes. So, for example, you, there are different kinds of um, um, categories that you can put the outcomes in. Strict outcomes, I'm going to say, are outcomes where I know they're measuring the exact same thing. So, this deworming program is measuring height in centimeters. Loose outcomes are going to be things where you know, these things are broadly related, but they're not quite the same. Um, so one study, for example, might say you've got anemia if your hemoglobin is less than X. Another study will say you've got hemoglobin if you're, sorry, you've got <laughs> anemia if your hemoglobin is less than Y, right? So those two things, because they've defined the outcome in a different way, you would expect some heterogeneity just from how they're defining the outcome. So I'll say that those are only, you know, the same if you're using this loose outcome definition. And then we had some broad outcome definitions um, where we did just ha have um, education, health, and um, economic outcomes. Um, now, for the purpose of this paper, I'm really focusing in almost entirely on strict outcomes. Um, there's a couple of exceptions, um, which maybe you can take issue with, but mostly I wanted to focus on the ones that are as narrow as possible so as to mitigate this issue of, you know, where is this heterogeneity coming from? I want things to be as similar as possible, but then not exclude some things that I thought were actually important. So, um, for example, uh, bed nets on malaria. He might define malaria in different ways for different projects, but if I didn't look at the impact of malaria, uh, of bed nets on malaria, I would be kind of concerned that I was doing, you know, something iffy. Consumption, uh, like, you say that, like, 
The way that people measure consumption in Ghana and consumption in Kenya, is that strictly the same or loosely the same or broadly the same? Yeah, so um, for, so this I can agree, there can be some differences. So we tried to at least convert everything to be in the same ultimate units. Um, so we adjusted anything that was like in whatever local currency to um, at least be in purchasing power parity adjusted dollars. Um, you can still quibble with that, I'm sure. Um, but I mean, we tried to do what we could. Um, I will agree that there are a lot of the papers where they uh, measured consumption in various different ways. So they would have like, here is consumption of these particular set of goods. And then here's consumption of this other, you know, maybe overlapping, maybe not set of goods. Um, so we were trying to restrict attention to um, like total consumption in some way, shape or form. Nonetheless, papers can report that in different ways. So like if a paper is only reporting, um, you know, your food consumption or something, I'm making this up now, but then we wouldn't include that as consumption. We were looking for estimates that in some sense, broadly speaking, would try to get a total quote unquote consumption. Yeah, so, so what's, what's interesting is like, I think that people have a, a desire to make things as strictly comparable as possible, but the interpretation that people have, in my view, is too literal. So for example, if I said like, I want to compare everybody's consumption of goats, but um, I've got countries from Africa, I've got countries from Central America, I've got Eastern European countries, like a goat is a very different thing to purchase in those different contexts. Yeah. Um, so that I think like now, yeah, my view is like, you know, the research is, the researchers who do the original studies are better positioned than me to make the call on what consumption is. So I just go with what the study says consumption is. But I do, obviously, a, a USD PPP adjustment, uh, which while, as you noted, like there's there's issues you can have with that, I think that's generally going to be better than not adjusting uh, for that. Um, but yeah, I, I think like, uh, I think that the, the way that people measure things not being exactly comparable across settings can be optimal. Uh, that, could, that could be an optimal equilibrium outcome of like how we learn. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's the view I wanted to push forward there as that's an alternative. Yeah. That's fair enough. Um, I mean, oftentimes papers that reported consumption would report like, you know, consumption in five different ways or something. So then there's also some question of, okay, well, which of these measures do I pick? So we're trying to be maximally comprehensive, um, but um, yeah. Um, so, um, sorry, what I mean there is we were trying to pick the one that had the most stuff in it. Um, if you reported, you know, uh, consumption of these goods, consumption of these goods in the superset, then great, we'll take the superset. Um, anyways, um, the other way in which you can argue with some of these definitions is, of course, with um, uh, the definition of the intervention itself, because you can imagine not every program, in fact, no, pro hardly any program has got exactly the same intervention, right? So um, conditional cash transfers will give you different amounts um, and so on and so on. So always the treatment is going to be slightly different. Um, now, we didn't try to, um, I keep on saying we, um, I guess I broadly mean aid grade, <laughs> um, but um, I <laughs> tried to keep things as, um, uh, broad as possible from the treatment side while looking at strict outcome definitions for the reason that I can look at strict outcome definitions and still have some overlap. If I did this with different treatments, I said every treatment is its own special thing, it's got to be exactly the same treatment, there like would be basically nothing here. <laughs> there just wouldn't be, right? Like now there's a few cases in which somebody has implemented the same quote unquote intervention in multiple countries. That's a relatively recent phenomenon and only in a handful of cases, you know, I'd be just out of luck. So that's why um, I went forward this way. Um, now, You'll remember that there were these uh, 635 papers that I started out with here. Um, unfortunately, just looking at these common outcomes and also reducing results uh, so that I'd have one per paper essentially to avoid dependence within a paper um, would uh, result in these 649 results across 277 papers. Um, and um, it, again, it depends how many how much overlap you need if you want two papers in that set, if you want three papers in that set. Um, so 
what I would say is like one very startling thing that came out of, to me of this work was just how little people were overlapping in the stuff that they were studying. Like, people should use common outcomes, and they don't. Um, there's, you know, good individual research incentive reasons as to that. You can imagine that, you know, no researcher wants to write the 10th paper on something, so they have to make it about something slightly different. But that is really horrible for the case of meta-analysis. So um, we're kind of stuck in this uh, situation. I mean, to be fair, I mean, I do think it is valuable to, you know, explore different parts of the space. Um, but it does make this particular thing challenging. Um, now, to contrast to this, um, there's this other paper that I look at, in which I look at specification searching and publication bias, and there I can use way more of the data. Um, so there's that. Um, although even then, sometimes um, results could not be used because either they were reported, there's some pretty old papers in here, um, some that don't have um, enough information to calculate p-values to three digits. Um, so that's why. Um, some of those were also dropped there, but in general, th that was a much bigger category. The main bottleneck here is on outcomes that overlap. Okay, so here's a nice table that summarizes um, variation in programs effects. I'm not see sure if you can read that at the back. I tried to make it big, but there's a lot of outcomes here. Um, and this um, is restricting um, attention to those that I believe have five or more um, estimates in them. Um, so, um, you get, you know, your, um, uh, there's a box and whiskers plot. So, you've got your outliers, which are just the dots, um, and interquartile range, I believe. Um, and so, there's a, and this is in terms of standardized, I mean, differences, again, I don't want to use standardized values too much, but here it helps to put everything in a box to observe things. I should also mention there's like one other outlier way out there, but it's just like one. Um, so, um, you know, there is quite a lot of overlap. Things that stood out to me, typically effect sizes are pretty small. <laughs> like, I came into this more optimistic thinking effect sizes would be somewhat larger. <laughs> They're pretty small. They're like, on average, maybe like 0.1 in my data. Um, also, there's quite a lot of overlap. So, you know, things are pretty routinely, you know, not um, working out. But, you know, there's so much overlap here, it's really hard to see what's going on. Um, but uh, typically speaking, you know, if you are looking at um, two different interventions and the same outcome, you're not going to be able to say which of those two interventions is, broadly speaking, better or worse than the other one um, if you're looking at the degree of overlap here, right? You could say one has a higher mean than the other, but so what, right? I mean, well, maybe it is important, but still. Okay. So, getting to some of these results these questions. Are, um, these are the So these, I think, are just the reported effects, right? So you can imagine that they'll be slightly different if you were to shrink them first. Yes. Yeah, so this is like, if you're like being really naive and just looking at the papers and being like, hey, I want to make policy based on these papers, hang on. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, and incidentally, I mean, this is a little bit of an aside, but I think I'll have the time since I've been just blazing through this. Um, you would think that actually heterogeneity can impact how people are um, updating on studies as well. So I've got this other paper where we're looking at how policymakers from World Bank conferences are updating based on you know, quote unquote impact evaluations, we show them. Some of them are real impact evaluations. We do do one component with hypothetical data, but you know, the first component is all real. Um, and you can easily imagine, well, um, if I'm somewhat neglecting, uh, so I, I, in that paper, coined this term variance neglect to say that people are somewhat neglecting the fact that there's a lot of variance. In that paper, I'm thinking about confidence intervals, but you can also imagine it for this. Um, you could imagine some systematic biases that people would have that would suggest that, you know, if you've got a lot of heterogeneity here, um, that could have, um, that could actually affect um, the kinds of results that people are remembering and circulating and acting upon. So, um, for example, if you are optimistic as well, um, and you've got an intervention outcome combination where you've got a lot of heterogeneity, um, well, you're going to be 
um, you know, more influenced in a way by that particular intervention outcome combination than one that's got um, a smallish range because you'll be paying attention to those outliers. You'll be, you know, updating asymmetrically based on those outliers. So there's interesting ways in which this interacts um, with updating as well. Just a side note, side paper plug. <laughs> All right. Um, so if you do this kind of exercise of trying to look at your, um, you know, equivalent of the type S and type M errors um, here, the median probability that the sign of what I'm calling here a similar study um, would be correctly predicted is about, you know, two-thirds. Um, so again, when I say similar study, what I mean by that is a study drawn from the same data, um, data generating process that got me these data. So I'm not considering, um, this is like almost like a best case scenario. I'm not even considering any kind of site selection bias that would probably make this worse. Um, for just a few of the intervention outcome combinations, um, can one correctly make the correct inference about the sign of a similar study at least 90% of the time. Um, so that's a little bit awkward. because I think generally we think that we're doing a little bit better than this. Um, and for some of them, it's like basically, you know, slightly better than chance um, as to whether you'll guess the sign correctly or not. Um, yeah. And so this is, so this is still the reported effects. No, so here what I'm doing is I am using um, the tau squares that are estimated, the mu's that are estimated, um, and essentially uh, building this model and then um, saying, okay, well, based on this, I'm going to make some prediction um, about what that next study will be. And without any other information, that prediction is just going to be the mean. Um, so I'll take that mean. And then I'll compare it to well, what if I actually do draw one from this distribution. I believe this is a true distribution. Um, so, you know, what would be the difference to that drawn study? So you have to take the model seriously, um, in a sense, to do this. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, sticking within the sample, it seems to be pretty reasonable. Um, in the paper, I do try to check the fit of the model a little bit. Um, it seems roughly reasonable, um, but it's hard with small yeah, it's hard with small numbers. Um, and so, okay, uh, and unheard. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> please do use the mic. Um, okay, so the idea. So this is for a um, the next. Study, or so you can think of it that way. But I haven't really put the, uh, this in terms of time period. So I'm actually no, no, using. No, no, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just saying like this is this is for a unknown future study drawn from the same distribution. Yes. Um, and so how do you uh, compute this probability on correctly predicting the sign? Like what's being used to predict the sign? Um, so I've got my uh, prediction based off of the mean. Okay. And so, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The, you know, well, the, the mu is at a certain point. Zero is at a certain point. I see, I see. That distribution, okay, some of the time, will you know. So yeah, I really like the the do the extension of type S and type M era um, to to this context. I think that's super good. Um, this slide is revealing to me a, 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 an issue with type S error that I never thought of until now, which is that if the effect of something is extremely small, yeah. uh, and in fact is pretty much zero on average, uh, of course your type you you know like nothing can predict which side of zero that thing will be on. Mm -hmm. It's basically zero. Yeah. So that's probably what's happening in the two literatures there. Um, but this is a this is a general problem with type S error. Uh, I, I just want to make that point. Like, this is not a problem with your thing. I want to make that point because it never occurred to me before that that would be an issue. Um, but yeah, if you have any thoughts on that, obviously interested. Yeah, no, that's completely fair. I mean, it definitely depends on the mu, that mean. Um, and it depends on, as well, the variance, obviously. Um, so it depends on both those things. So, you know, you, um, I mean, you're quite right. I mean, we, 
do tend to talk about sign as like a thing that is somewhat important. It might be more important for those things that we also think are somewhat more positive than just barely above zero. So maybe the situations where we want to think about this, you know, um, are also slightly different. I mean, maybe you only want to look at the results for those interventions where you say, well, this is you know, plausible that I would even consider this. But I completely agree. I mean, as you get close to zero, I mean, it should go to 50-50. Um, yep. What are the characteristics of the literatures where you get um, fairly good predictions? Yeah. Outcomes, is it homogeneity in interventions? Is it context? Oh, great question. That may not be a factually, like a, yeah. you may not have a statistical answer to that question, but well, it's I'll still just an impression. Well, I'll try to get at that a little bit, but I won't be able to get at it perfectly because first of all, like these are very few things. Like um, ultimately I've got 57 intervention outcome combinations. Um, and uh, later on, I'll try to do a little bit, but 10 of them won't be able to be standardized. So, ah, um, so yeah, I'll get to pretty small samples, but um, nonetheless, broadly speaking, um, so some of them, like, I think, you know, honestly, like microfinance and financial literacy did particularly poorly. Um, I don't know quite what to make of that. Some of it might be the things just are very, very context dependent. Some of it might be, I mean, I'm not really sure what it is, to be honest. Um, but I will get to, let me maybe continue on and then I'll try to talk to a couple of things that, you know, seem to be somewhat correlated. Um, I'll also say this median um, root MSE um, standardized by the estimate of that mean um, is pretty large. <laughs> um, again, it'll depend on what this mean is exactly, so fair point. Um, but um, it's pretty big. I was surprised. I wasn't hoping to find this. I was, I was thinking I would find, you know, probably something else. Um, so, okay. Um, so, okay, what kinds of characteristics did particularly well? Um, some of them um, seemed to, um, so I'm using this like, this kind of thing here because it's a standardized measure. It's a unitless measure. So if you've got something that's in terms of, you know, percentage points or whatever. This is like your equivalent of your coefficient of variation. So let me just talk about the, the ones that had small ones of those, and it will roughly translate in some sense, very roughly. <laughs> um, some of the lowest values were for conditional cash transfers and health-related interventions. Um, I'm going to very loosely argue um, with a lot of hand-waving. I mean, I'll show you some things, but I mean, this is more of a... Um, uh, description that I think is intuitive rather than backed up by firm amounts of data, um, that those interventions that are either, the effect is more direct in some way. Um, so, um, you know, we've got conditional cash transfers or performance uh, pay programs where um, there is some, um, um, well, conditionality really um, and some direct incentives imposed. Uh, th those incentives maybe will help um, nudge things in the same direction. Um, Health-related interventions are also maybe particularly direct, so um, I don't know, but very loosely that seems to be, you know, if I have to, if I have to uh, put my name to something, I guess that would be the things I would say. Um, here I've just sort of categorized, just so you can see, obviously this is, I mean, a little bit um, just from how the model works, if you've got like a low um, mu, estimated mu, or a high estimated mu, and this is using all the studies in the sample, or a low and high um, estimated tau squared, um, you know, how do these probability of getting the right sign, or the root mean squared error, how do those change? So obviously, I mean, this is just coming out of the model, um, but um, if you are um, lucky enough to have a very high mean, very low variance, the probability you get the sign correct is really, really high. Um, if you have a really low mean, high variance, probability is pretty much 50-50. <laughs> um, and, you know, you can see similar things-ish at work um, in a different sense for this uh, task squared n um, uh, for your mean uh, squared error. Basically, like, the high ones here are going to be the most significant things. But there aren't that many intervention outcome combinations in a particular bin here. I've just divided up the bins, like literally like a third of the sample, a third, a third, um, by intervention outcomes. And so how they overlap, um, sometimes is not very much. So be a little bit cautious of these estimates. Okay, so I'll try to uh, run ahead. I'm running out of time already, but I'll talk a little bit about modeling heterogeneity. Um, so here's just an OLS regression. This is using standardized 
values because I've got to use, you know, different intervention outcome combinations. And I've got fixed effects for each intervention outcome here, um, which is going to be important because otherwise things can get way out of control. Um, so here, what you can see is the larger studies tend to have smaller effects. Um, the government implemented programs also have smaller effects, even controlling for sample size. Um, you can imagine some story like I was alluding to this morning where, um, you know, potentially as you expand the program, um, it gets worse in some way. Maybe you've got capacity constraints. Maybe, you know, as you're doing a larger program, people are not incentivized in the same way to implement it correctly. Maybe it's just a targeting story. Like, there's a lot of things that could be going on there. Um, not much regional variation. Um, I think this is just chance. There's not that many observations here. Um, so there's that. Um, if you try to see whether tau squared varies by anything. Um, so as I was saying earlier, there are not that many observations here. I don't want to lean too hard on this because I have to do regressions at the intervention outcome level here. Um, and some of them can't be standardized, so I'm left with a pretty small set. Um, here, uh, you might think, well, what's an equivalent to this kind of table, except with, um, you know, um, at the intervention outcome level, well, maybe I can look at the variance of the sample size or the variance of whether something was implemented by the government or not, um, or just the number of countries or the number of studies um, to avoid having, like, loads of uh, individual dummies for each country or something like that. That would be horrible. Um, I mean, I think in any case, you know, there aren't that many uh, observations. I can't, like, throw a lot of things in. And also, I think that here I can't, unfortunately, because of this, um, control for intervention outcome fixed effects or anything like that. I, I mean, I can't. Or even intervention fixed effects or even outcome fixed effects. Um, so um, this worries me because of this issue that um, certain um, types of interventions or certain types of outcomes will systematically have higher or lower tau squareds, right, because of their units being different. So, for example, um, think of conditional cash transfers. Um, I would say they've got a really uh, large variance in sample size. You have stuff from Progressa down to little things. Um, so there you've got something huge, and you just tend to have low tau squareds. So I'm not a huge fan. Um, but, you know, you can do this kind of thing as well for looking at the means. Um, I'm just going to jump to this. Here's what I'm saying about health and conditionality. Um, maybe things that um, are health interventions or what I'm calling conditional interventions have got lower tau squares. I do some robustness checks where these are not significant. So, you know, um, take from it what you will, but essentially, like, changing up what's the definition of a health program, changing up what's the definition of a program that's um, conditional in some sense. Um, but nonetheless, there that is. I also look a little bit within intervention outcome, um, but as we've repeatedly heard, there's not going to be that many studies, so there's going to be, like, extreme risk of overfitting here. Um, and then try to, but try to use, like, the best predictor in some sense to calculate the residual heterogeneity measurements and see how much that helps. Um, broadly speaking, it um, doesn't help by super much. Here's like the best outcome that was selected and the number of observations, though. Um, so, you know, where you're getting some most improvement from um, some of these uh, tau squares and i squares um, to the residual versions of the is probably overfitting. Um, but you do get some reduction there. Um, so, as I'm already way over, um, just to sum up, um, I think the main takeaways here, there does seem to be a large degree of heterogeneity. It's not um, all sampling error. It's not um, easily explained by other factors. I do think one could do more using micro data to explain some of this a little bit better. Um, um, there's some general statistics that we also sort of learn from this, some generalized stylized facts that, for example, larger projects obtain smaller effect sizes and um, the government implemented projects fare a little bit worse. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, overall, I'm, um, while I myself was disappointed, 
at the negativity of the results, I would like to somewhat still end on an optimistic note that I think we can do better with uh, more micro data. Uh, potentially, you know, in the future, there are my, in my dream world, there will also be more overlap and outcome variables, and you can do more stuff. Um, but I'll just leave it there uh, for now. Um, I think you know, main contributions are thinking through this uh, type S, type M errors with respect to this as a general framework for um, thinking about um, how much one can extrapolate. So you can do this kind of modeling, not just for this, but for other questions. Thanks.